Hello, everybody. We're going to get started with this next session. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Don Durfee I'm with Reuters. Uh, the previous moderator, Peter Thal Larson, um, unfortunately wasn't able to attend, so I'm, I'm here in his place. Um, I'm really excited about this panel. Uh, we're here for the Digitizing Global Trade panel. Um, I think it's really appropriate that we're doing this in China, um, the world's biggest uh, actor in global trade, um, and also increasingly the hub of e-commerce innovation. We think about, about what Alibaba has done in China, and it's really you know, reshaping uh, the way we think about e-commerce globally. Um, so I think this is a, is a great time to be doing this. And I'm really excited about this panel as well. It's a very diverse panel. We have uh, people from multinationals, um, a government minister from <coughs> Malaysia, uh, an entrepreneur, um, and uh, consultants looking at technology issues. So the key question that people are going to be addressing <coughs> is uh, how is digital technology transforming goods and services trades across borders? Um, we'll have a discussion about this, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience, so feel free to address questions uh, to the panelists. So let me just introduce uh, the panelists. So to my immediate left is Hank Wu. Hank is the chairman of TrueTag Technologies. Uh, he's a surgeon, an inventor, and an entrepreneur, and he's led the development of over 20 biomedical devices, innovations, however. Uh, next to him is Alan Gershenhorn. Alan is the Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer for UPS. Currently, he directs uh, global sales for the company, customer relationship management, segment marketing, um, and e-commerce, among other things. And then next is uh, Minister Mustafa Mohammed. He is the Minister of International Trade and Industry for Malaysia. Um, he's held various roles in the Malaysian government, including as Minister of Higher Education, Minister of Agriculture uh, and Agro-Based Industry, and since 2009, the Minister of International Trade and Industry. And then finally, we have Paul Dougherty. Paul is the Chief Technology Officer of Accenture, uh, the consulting firm. He's responsible for R&D, technology strategy, emerging technologies, <coughs> strategic investments and alliances. Uh, please welcome the panelists. So I'd like to, to kick off, um, and I'd like each panel just to address what they think is, what's the key idea uh, that we have to bear in mind when we think about the impact of digital technologies on supply chains? Um, Hank, maybe we could start with you. Thanks very much. First of all, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, my, my background is really in healthcare. I'm a surgeon by training, so I, my perspective is really sort of a defined more from a healthcare perspective. I'll give you an example, right? 96% uh, <clears throat> of the internet sellers of pharmaceuticals <clears throat> do not meet the standards for safety, for patient safety and advocacy. Um, the global trade for counterfeit drugs is over $430 billion. Millions of people die each year from <clears throat> the ingestion of drugs that are not genuine. So from our, from our perspective, safety, safety is one of the most critical issues. In fact, we just learned last week in Geneva in another meeting with the World Economic Forum that the security of food, medicine, nutritionals is the number one potential global destabilizer. So that's kind of, from my perspective, that's where digital security can play a very substantial role in ensuring the supply chain of everything we put into our body. That's fascinating, really, uh, really interesting point. Um, Paul, how about you? Or Alan, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I also want to, uh Say so I'm thankful for, for being here today, and uh, you know I think that uh, you know one of the most profound uh, changes that we're seeing with uh, um, the, the effect of the digital economy on global trade is the fact that you know global trade used to be for the big boys and girls, the uh, the multinational corporations, and what we're seeing now is that uh, small medium enterprises that uh, traditionally have always traded very locally can now you know, compete uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in the global economy. And a big part of that is uh, really two factors. One, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the impact of uh, uh, the digital technology as well as uh, you know, robust supply chains like, uh, like the one that, one that UPS has. And that's it's having a profound effect. And I think uh, you know, a good example of that is when you look at uh, retail and e-commerce, you know, uh, 
you know, in-country, traditional retail, brick and mortar, probably grows about, uh, you know, one and a half times GDP is a, is a good number to, to, to think of about that. Online commerce within countries is growing at about four times GDP, but cross-border e-commerce is growing at about seven times GDP. And while it's, uh, it's on a much smaller base, you could see the effect of, uh, uh, of the opportunity that these SMEs are seeing with uh, being able to expand their, their customer base, not only from locally to countrywide, but, uh, but to the world. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a really profound uh, transformation when you think about the opportunities for smaller companies to act on a global scale. Uh, Minister Mustafa, uh, how about you? I'm looking from the uh, uh, policy perspective, uh, of course, uh, Don. Uh, let me look at my country briefly and ASEAN. This year, we are chair of ASEAN. Uh, lots of meetings uh, in Kuala Lumpur. In Malaysia, digital technology <coughs> has played a very important role. Uh, and you're right, uh, small medium enterprises. Uh, you have um, Uber Taxi, you know, which is big. But in Malaysia, we have Grab Taxi, which is uh, a Malaysian small company, which is opening six, seven countries now. Mm -hmm. So this is an example. We have the airlines, the banks, and digital economy is very much uh, part of the uh, part of the uh, strategy. Uh, and we are one of the most trade dependent economies in the world, Malaysia. <coughs> Uh, and uh, of course, di digital technology uh, is very important, and uh, we have in place uh, policies to encourage the use of digital mm -hmm. technology. That's on a national uh, Malaysian point of view. On the ASEAN, uh, uh, we chair ASEAN. Uh, I chaired a meeting of ASEAN economic ministers uh, two weeks ago, and early this year we launched an ASEAN ICT master plan, yeah, which is to, and that's about putting policies in place. Uh, about getting more people coming on board, uh, about infrastructure, about connectivity, uh, about uh, uh, narrowing the, the gap. Between, ASEAN has got 10 countries and some are poor, some are very rich. Singapore is a developed economy, allows, you know, of course, at least a developed economy. So the challenge is how to bridge the gap. So this ICT plan is about uh, bridging the digital divide. You, know? mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, uh, mobile penetration, as low as 20% in some countries, 140% in some of the countries, so a big gap. So for us in ASEAN, um, trade is important, 25% of uh, trade is intra-trade, mm -hmm. and e-commerce is important, and uh, we, have, uh, we are at the end of this year launching uh, a plan to develop uh, small and medium enterprises, and of course uh, e-commerce and the digital economy is very much uh, is, is, is central to all this. So we depend on trade and investments, ASEAN, and more so Malaysia, therefore uh, it is important for us to put policies in place uh, to make sure that uh, we are not left out uh, in this uh, competition. Yeah. It's becoming more and more intense out there. Right. Okay. Yeah. So using e-commerce to really drive uh, economic sort of regional, development, regional trade, and, yeah, and economic yeah, development. Trade and economic yes, development. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Paul. Yeah. Just uh, building on what the you know, and the, what the minister said. If you kind of back up and look at where we are. With, uh, with all the digital technology, we're, we're at the very early stages of what we believe, and I think many believe is a massive shift in the economy in many ways as, as, uh, as the economy and as, you know, as industries and as countries around the world adapt to digital technology and transform, and we believe it's very, you know, it's very disruptive. And I, you know, so I think we're at a, a pivotal time in really thinking through what is the impact on whether it be healthcare, transportation, or, or uh, countries like Malaysia in the, in the future. We've done some work recently uh, we looked at the impact of all this from a, from a, a GDP and economic perspective, and we believe that the, the digital technology and that we're seeing, the digital revolution, will have a $14 trillion <coughs> impact on the global, uh, global GDP and the global economy by 2030, so $14 trillion impact, $1.8 trillion of that in China alone. And the interesting thing when you look at the analysis is that there's a, a big variable component about, uh, of that which will, be, which will depend on companies and countries taking the right moves proactively to reshape themselves to benefit from uh, what we're seeing. And I think when you look at it from a supply chain perspective, we're at a stage where we're starting to see you know, that play out when you look at you know, the move to things like digital supply networks, uh, new forms of you know, technology informing new forms of transportation. You know, we mentioned Uber earlier. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's causing a, a major disruption. And so what we, what we believe is really important at this point in time for every company, every country, every policymaker to think about is how do you respond to that disruption and mm -hmm. what changes do you make now to position yourself to take advantage of that opportunity that's coming? Mm. 
yeah, no, it's a, it's a massive shift for sure. Um, I'd like to turn the, the conversation to the effect, how supply chains are going to change as a result of te digital technology. What changes are we already seeing? Um, and Alan, UPS you know, sits at the heart of many global supply chains. So you guys really have a, a finger on the, on the pulse uh, of the changes. How do you see supply chains changing? Yeah, so, uh, you, know, you know, a couple things. Um, you know, you know, first the you know the the express industry, you know, which is one of the markets that uh, that the UPS plays in, is you know on a global basis is really relatively small compared to you know the ocean freight business and the air freight business. And what you're seeing is that uh, you know more and more with this e-commerce trend, and it's not just always you know business to consumer; it's also B to B. You know, the uh, you know companies are are are, are working on going more direct. Uh, to consumer or to the, the business consumer, you know, bypassing um, what, what may be uh, traditional channels. Um, so you're seeing smaller shipments, um, um, less, less inventory. You know, today, uh, you know, in, in the United States, not to uh, use the same exact number as Paul used for something else, but uh, there's, there's about $1.8 trillion of inventory right now, you know, sitting in the United States, you know, on a shelf somewhere. Um, waiting potentially, uh, or not potentially, for, 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 for somebody, somebody to purchase. So there's, there's a big opportunity here with the, the, the digital economy to you know, better align you know, supply and demand, as well as to cut out steps in the supply chain mm -hmm. that allow for more direct, you know, smaller type shipments, and that's what we're seeing. The other thing I would add is that you know, when you think about retail, I mean, retail you know, traditionally has been very local. Um, and I know that, you know, I was, I was on a run this morning with one of my colleagues and you, you see a lot, you know, the luxury brands are probably some of the brands that have gone global more quickly than others. But, but generally speaking, you know, uh, uh, you know brands or certainly uh, um, uh, multi-product department store type of brands are, are, are local, even sometimes smaller than, uh, than a country <coughs> footprint. Um, but what you're seeing now is that uh, you know you know retailers are, are able to reach you know consumers, you know around around the world, and that's traditionally an industry that has had very little you know trade or supply chain outside of a country border. Industrial manufacturers, um, you know high tech companies, um, energy and and uh, uh, and some other areas you know have been uh, traversing the globe for quite some time. But there there are industries out there like retail that haven't been doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's going to demand uh, a significant look at supply chain so that we can uh, you know, handle the needs of, of, the, of those type of businesses to meet the needs of the consumers. Interesting, interesting. And, um, Paul, do you, see, do you see those kinds of changes as well? I mean, when uh, sort of a retailer who might have been purely US-based, a uh, small retailer, suddenly has the ability to you know, export around the world and do that very efficiently. You know, what are some of the kinds of changes that have to happen on the management of that company to make that, uh, make that work? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the, uh, the way I look at it, with you know, the way that supply chains are transforming, there's two big types of changes. One is compressing time, and the other is, is compressing space. If you look at you know, the compressing time, you know, the, uh, what we're seeing is a, a, a major shift to connected products, you know, things that are connected in real time, which transform the way you think about your supply chain. So if you have a connected vehicle, uh, that uh, you know, a connected vehicle that's uh, where you can, in real time understand drive behavior characteristics, pre preventive maintenance needs and such, you can dramatically transform the products and services you sell to the customer by having real time information continuously from that customer and you know, transform the way you think about the supply chain and delivering services. So you can compress time in that sense. And you can also use, you know, in that sense, uh, predictive analytics in a very powerful way. There's a, a big, uh, one of the largest water and sewage distributors in Europe. Uh, we're working with a program on a program with them uh, to instrument their whole, uh, all their facilities, mm -hmm. so that in real time we can understand the flow of water and sewage through the different pipes <laughs> for the water and sewage, and understand how to uh, operate the network more efficiently. And they found that just by having better information on the network, they could, they could pump 17% more water through the same pipes, mm -hmm. which is a dramatic in, in, increase in asset of efficiency, and, in, and that's their form of the supply chain that they deal with. So that's in the compressing time and efficiency domain. In the compressing space, I think there's a lot of new technologies that we haven't fully exploited yet. If you look at autonomous vehicles, 
and the, the, uh, the, the impact that they can have on, on supply chains and that they're already having in industries like mining, when you look at the supply chains in those industries. If you look at uh, things like uh, drones, which are being used to you know, delivery uh, many companies uh, already in, you know, on a certain basis and expanded use of that technology. And then you look at things like 3D printing, which is really virtualizing the product itself. Uh, we're doing work with energy companies where for their oil platforms, they may print a lot of their replacement parts on the oil platform to avoid the you know, supply chain of getting goods out to offshore drilling platforms and things like that. So you know, if you look at that time and space element, I think there's a lot of technology that's really transforming the, you know, the, the premise on which you even think about constructing your supply chain. That's fascinating. I mean, does that require huge investments in technology for companies to be able to handle this? Or how do, you, how do companies actually adapt to those opportunities? It, I think it, it requires investments in technology. What we believe, you know, what we're seeing is it also requires a different way of thinking about your business model. In many cases, you might need to collaborate with others for the information that, you know, that, it, that you need to, you know, to construct the, 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 you know, your supply network in that sense. So it's leading to, you know, new technology investments. Uh, we, you know, to companies needing to experiment and innovate with, with new technology at a smaller scale before they expand. And then also think about who you, who you partner with that can bring in those capabilities, what technology companies, but what, also, what companies across other industries. An example I'll give you is, uh, is work that Visa is doing with, with uh, Pizza Hut and, uh, and, uh, and some car companies to look at how they can create a commerce platform for a car. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's, a, it's a financial services company coming together with, a, in this case, Pizza Hut, was a, a you know, right. pizza delivery company in the U.S., and, uh, and a car company to look at how they you know, create a new, a new connected car commerce platform. And we see a lot more of those cross-industry models mm -hmm. coming to play as you think about delivering different services. Interesting. Uh, Minister Mustafa, I'm interested in the, the policy perspective. Um, Malaysia is leading the effort on the ASEAN economic community. Um, it's identified connectivity and e-commerce as a key plank in that effort. Um, how do you see how do you see e-commerce really driving this effort? E-commerce uh, is catching up, uh, and uh, uh, let me look at two perspectives. One is the um, small and medium enterprises, uh, which are catering to the domestic market. Secondly, uh, e-commerce in the context of multinational companies operating in ASEAN and how they are interacting with with uh, local small and medium enterprises to be part of the global supply chain. On the, uh, on the uh, SMEs, indigenous SMEs supplying the local market, there's been uh, quite a you know, radical transformation. I mean, you've got, you got to embrace uh, digi the digital economy, and uh, uh, those who do not do that will be left behind. I mean, there's so many success stories in my own, own country, people selling small items like food, biscuits, those kinds of things, who've done very well. And the, the, the big examples would be Asia, which is leading. Uh, in e-commerce uh, uh, throughout the region. So these are, I mean, you've got to embrace, otherwise you're left behind. This point about, about cutting time and becoming more efficient is real. Yeah, I mean, uh, you will not be productive. You will not be able to, to compete. It's a very uh, uh, fierce environment out there. So number one, uh, is, it, is, it is important for, uh, even for those uh, enterprises catering to the domestic market to embrace uh, digital technology. It is a must. Mm -hmm. so, investments in technology, human capital, uh, this, there, there is this realization uh, that uh, to be successful, uh, you need to embrace fully uh, digital technology. The other will be uh, the connection between multinationals and the uh, local enterprises. Uh, uh, here again, uh, uh, the digital economy has, has done a lot in terms of getting them connected to the world uh, through procurement and you know, uh, sharing of best practices, pricing policies. And that has driven, uh, uh, that has made some of these enterprises globally competitive. So that has connected them to the world. They are part of the global supply chain. Mm. So you have multinational enterprises in ASEAN, in Malaysia, which has got links with uh, small, medium enterprises in my country and a few other countries. They started small, but being part of this uh, big uh, supply chain. They are supplying not only uh, to uh, companies operating in my country, in Malaysia, but also to the world. So that's a very interesting phenomenon whereby the market would be small uh, in the beginning, but as a result of them, as a result of them sure. yeah. coming on board and em embracing digital technology, uh, the world is the market. So there are some radical changes going on. But uh, the point is, uh, people, especially small and medium enterprises, are beginning to realize that if they don't embrace uh, the digital uh, economy or they're not part of it, then they're going to be left behind. They're not going to be Efficient, sure. yeah. they're not going to be uh, 
productive and they're going to be left out and they're not going to be, be successful in the business and they cannot be part of the global economy. Right, right, okay. Um, Hank, one, one thing that's interesting, um, one side effect of digital, digitally enabled trade uh, is that things are much more efficient for counterfeiters uh, as well as legitimate businesses. Um, do you want to you talked a little bit in your introductory remarks about the risk of uh, counterfeit medical goods and other kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit more about the scale of the problem and what some of the solutions might be? Sure, happy to. So the, the global trade for, for counterfeit goods is in the trillions of dollars, right? And, and many believe that is actually the most profitable business in the world because it impacts every product, every market, everywhere, without exception. Uh, it's in the trillions. But whereas someone may say, all right, it's okay for me to go buy a fake Gucci bag or Prada shoes because it looks pretty good and it costs me less, that, that might be okay, but it's not a victimless event because jobs are being lost. But on the other hand, nobody in their right minds wants to take a fake drug for diabetes, for cancer chemotherapy, uh, for high blood pressure. And, and guess what? Uh, every part of the world, whether you're in the developed world or a developing world, there is an equal chance you could pick up a drug that's a counterfeit. It could be a genuine drug or it could be filled with uh, brick powder for all you know. But the magnitude of the problem is really significant, right? Hundreds, $430 billion a year, according to the latest statistics from the World Health Organization. But digital technology actually gives us an opportunity. It provides us with an opportunity to be able to have a direct impact on that, to allow us the ability to track and trace and in fact authenticate product and in many ways to enable the Internet of Things in such a way that we can significantly dampen the harmful effects of counterfeit goods, especially in the area of counterfeit medicine. So the, one of the reasons I'm here and Dalian is because one of our portfolio companies, True Tech Technologies, was selected a tech pioneer by the forum. Mm -hmm. And uh, this company has, is developing a platform, a security platform, to address this very issue of product authentication. Right? So the company has developed a chip. It's a size of a piece of dust. Right? And within each dust, it, millions of combinations of optical spectral data can be embedded. But this material, among other things, is edible. It's ingestible, which means it can be applied to every one of the 1.5 trillion pills made in the world every year. And by taking out your phone, you can scan it and it can tell you who made it, when it expires, what are the drug interactions, who is the distribution network, the entire provenance of that product. Why? Because labels and packaging is how products are identified and tracked through the supply chain today. But labels and packaging are inherently easy to mimic and to copy. Anyone can do it. A high schooler with a good printer can do that. However, with the technology has the ability to basically fingerprint a set of unique proprietary digital identifier that's unique and the very fabric of that product makes it inherently difficult yeah. for counterfeiters to tackle that problem, number one. Number two, to allow us to be able to digitally track products through the global supply chain on an individual item basis without any reliance on packaging and labels. So I, that's really the future that we see sure. in, a, in using digital technology to fundamentally transform the marketplace. Interesting. So, so is this the future or is this already here? Is this something that, that uh, we can are, be done today? We are, the future is sort of already here, actually. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's fascinating. Uh, so on this, this issue of security and supply chains, I, I mean, um, Hank raised a really interesting point. And um, uh, Paul, I'm curious, I, do you think this kind of thing can work in a global supply chain? Um, are there other kinds of things that we can do uh, to counter counterfeiting? Well, I think, yeah, as, as Hank said, you know, the, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed is the, the yeah. famous quote yeah. by William Gibson. And the, uh, and I think that's true in this area. I think there's you know, technology. I think uh, Hank's got some in his pocket. You know, that's technology that his company has yeah. that uh, that um, that uh, you know can be can be applied in, in the, these cases. Now we're we're doing work with companies around drug seal serialization to individually fingerprint uh, you know, pills and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's possible to do today. There's a cost benefit, you know, in terms of what it what it takes to do that. And we're seeing that in the food supply chain becoming more important. There's a major uh, seafood uh, wholesaler in the United Kingdom, United Kingdom who uh, they, uh, you can, whenever you buy a can of their mm. seafood or one of their seafood products, it's got a unique tag on it. And you can look at that, you can look up that tag online and figure out where that fish came from, what, what ship caught it, when it was caught, how it was packed, et cetera. So you can get a tremendous amount of information on the supply and the food supply chain in that case. So I, I think it is important. And I think the, um, you know, being able to 
provide customers with better, uh, you know, with better, um, you know, authenticity and uh, uh, better trust around the products they're buying is going to be essential in this in this in the digital world because the, a lot of the products and services we're talking about, connected vehicles, connected homes, etc., are, are very involve very in, you know, invasive uh, services for customers yeah. that are very close to them. They involve a lot of private and very personal information, and I think the ability to make sure that you're pro first of all that you're providing it in a secure fashion, and then as a company that, that you're taking the appropriate trust and respect. For but not just you know not just protecting the data, but with, for the customers' privacy considerations, is going to be a key differentiator between custom, customers. And by, if you look at what's happened to date in, in digital, a lot of the uh, the state of, of of the art in digital right now is exploita exploitation of customer information. How can it maximize the click-throughs and, and things like that? And I think with connected products and Internet of Things and these very connected supply chains, it shifts to how do you really you know, ensure and gain the trust of the customer mm -hmm. to provide the services that they want you to provide. Right, right. Interesting. Um, and Alan, how about in the, the, the supply chains, the UPSCs? Do you see new ways of ensuring sort of the security uh, of those things? Yeah. yeah, you know, I think, you know, the opportunity is absolutely immense. Mm. And uh, certainly what, uh, what Hank and his, his company are doing in that area is just is, is fascinating. You can see the power of, uh, of digital technology and what it can enable. But what we got to think about is, yes, we want to stop all these Ill illegitimate goods, and certainly, uh, you know, uh, you know, counterfeit healthcare, which uh, you know could be um, devastating. Um, you know, getting 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 into the supply chain um, on uh, on the mass basis that Hank described. But but we also have to talk about you know how we're going to speed the legitimate goods, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is to use digital technologies and advanced supply chains to stop right. the illegitimate goods and at the same time speed the legitimate goods. And there's, there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to happen there with public and private partnerships, you know, the, uh, the, the, the customs regulations and the other regulatory authorities, um, you know, in some countries are more advanced mm. and technologically uh, aligning, you know, with uh, supply chain providers like UPS and and uh, um, you know some of the uh, the shippers of uh, you know uh, of pharmaceuticals, and, and so on and so forth. But there, but there's a lot to be done there, and technology becomes that that great enabler. I mean, we, you know, many of us that flew here from uh, from another country, you know, filled out the little paper card, you know, on the on on the aircraft, and there there are a lot better ways to do that. Um, you know, going into the United States, at least in Atlanta now, they finally automated that card, um, and. And not only is that a, um, a cost reduction, but, but it's also making you know, the, the human supply chain um, you know, safer and more secure because you know, having that data in a, in a digital format you know, allows, allows you to do uh, a heck of a lot more with that to make sure it's, uh, it's safe and secure. And that's the same thing you know, for goods. And uh, certainly with, with e-commerce and uh, lower cost, you know, uh, lower, lower uh, overall value of goods crossing borders, you know, customs authorities are, are challenged with the amount of goods that are coming in and, uh, and a way to deal with it effectively, doing what we need to do, you know, stopping the illegitimate goods and, and, uh, and, uh, and speeding the legitimate goods. So, you know, we're working, you know, in partnership with governments on, on single window clearance, which, which really means, you know, how do we get all the regulatory agencies together and make sure that the data that we provide is, is holistic and, and allows every regulatory authority to deal with that data in a, uh, in, in a, in a fast manner, but, 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 but do their job well and, and, uh, and protect us from the, the illegitimate, uh, the goods uh, coming in. Um, and, and also working with the data analytics to target in advance. You know, you, you have an opportunity in, in most cases, uh, you, know, some, you know, if it's in, in air freight, it's, sometimes it's uh, 10, 20, 10 to 24 hours uh, by the time the, uh, the data is in UPS's hands that we can uh, you know, get it to the customs authorities of, uh, of countries so that they can begin to run the analytics on that. So when the, when the goods make it to the country, you know, it's red light, green light. You know, it's, uh, hey, we already know which goods we want to stop. All the rest are going through. So there's, there's a big opportunity here, and that's, that's an area that we need to address, which is, is going to be a win-win for, for governments 
and for businesses and for consumers going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, it raises the issue that you, know, you can have all the digital technology you want, but there are still trade rules and you need uh, sort of uh, <coughs> customs agencies to help you out with it. Don, can I? Yeah, Minister, please. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the issue of traceability, mm. which is uh, very important for drugs. Uh, consumers are very careful now. Standards, uh, you know, are, are very important. Uh, looking at agriculture uh, is another important uh, area. Uh, in the area of palm oil, uh, my country and in Indonesia, we are the biggest producers of palm oil, and consumers are demanding uh, standards, uh, of course, <coughs> environment and uh, traceability. So this is an issue. But uh, for us, uh, there's got to be some kind of balance. On the one hand, uh, you want to ensure the strictest of standards. At the same time, we do not want this to go overboard um, and develops into a non-tariff non measure, you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it can be used by countries uh, to prevent the entry of certain goods into some developed markets. So, this is, there's got to be balance. Yeah? Uh, of course, yeah. we recognize as producers of palm oil, for example, it's very important to have this traceability. Consumers have a right to demand where the products come from, uh, and we're doing that uh, in, in ASEAN. Uh, but uh, we have to make sure that this is not being used uh, as a measure uh, to obstruct uh, legitimate and yes. fair trade. That's one point. The other is the issue of regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, uh, single window. Uh, we got this, uh, it's going to be rolled out in ASEAN uh, and all the documentation <coughs> is going to be there. And you're right, I mean, with this sing full implementation of single window in ASEAN, uh, we're going to be able to, uh, to, to improve, uh, firstly, on customs clearance. Yeah? Uh, but some of the additional standards uh, will be incorporated in that. So, from the policy point of view, uh, we, we need to provide uh, the uh, appropriate environment uh, to ensure uh, that all these things are put in place. Uh, traceability, uh, counterfeit uh, drugs, quality agriculture products. Uh. Mm -hmm. So, my, my, my point is, firstly, uh, yes, we recognize that this is important. Mm -hmm. yeah, consumers demand that, but uh, we have to make sure that it does not result in unfair trade. And secondly, for governments, it is important to have an appropriate uh, a policy framework uh, to ensure that we can deal with all these issues of security and traceability. Yes, yeah. No, it's a really important issue to think about when crafting international trade <coughs> rules. Um, one thing before I, I turn it over to the audience for questions, um, you know, we are here in China having this, this session. Um, China's home to Alibaba and many other sort of e-commerce pioneers. And, you know, I live in Beijing, and I've sort of been amazed to watch uh, sort of the rapid advance of e-commerce and how easy it is to do things, you know, via a mobile phone, have a package delivered the same day in many cases. Do you guys think that the future of e-commerce is here, essentially? To what degree will we see uh, the development of e-commerce overseas looking like it looks in, in China? I'm just curious for your views. Um, Paul, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's uh, been great innovation. You look at Alibaba and uh, you know some of the, the models that have uh, have been wildly successful in China. I think they show a great way to adopt uh, those models uh, elsewhere in the world. I think there's you know, similar you know, models coming out of some of the you know, Sil Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs, and other other spots in the in the U.S. and in some other markets. But I think increasingly, if you look at the you know the pace of technology innovation in in China and, and elsewhere, you know through the, through the Asia region. And, um, and the scale of the investment and the way that the, the scale of the problems or the scale of the opportunities they have and the scale of the problems that they need to solve, I think we'll see many more, uh, many more very innovative solutions and business models and technology solutions that come out of you know, China and, and other markets and move back west. Um, and we, you know, we're seeing that happen in China, we're seeing it happen in India and some other markets too, where the technolo technology is not you know, coming from the west, but mm -hmm. technology is coming from those countries and in many cases providing better models and better technology to, to adopt back to western markets. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Alan, do you see, is there anything to be learned um, in terms of supply chain management from the way things are evolving here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, we're kind of at the beginning of the future here. I'm not, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, marketplaces are, are a phenomena that will uh, continue to grow. You know, I, I think it, it comes down to, you know, the, 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 the power of the Internet. And I think a few years ago, folks referred to the, to the information superhighway. You know, that's kind of a, an old coined term now. It's really, it's really the, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, the my way 
the my way superhighway, sure. right? Yeah. And, uh, and and we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of changes that are going to be enabled by uh, uh, digital technology. Some some of the, some of the things you know we're looking at um, and, and that we're engaged in is you know um, just something really simple. You know, when we make a, you know you know millions of uh, uh, if not billions of home deliveries every year, and and anybody that's that's gotten a home delivery or, or not gotten a successful home delivery. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's UPS or somebody else. You get that delivery notice on your door, and uh, now you're now you're going to try to figure out, you know, why did I get the delivery notice? You know, what do I need to do to, to receive my package? We we again through uh, through some of the technologies we have um, now have a technology called UPS My Choice that you basically uh, every UPS package coming to your home you get an alert, you know, whenever you want it. And uh, when you get that alert, you know, it tells you who the package is coming from. It allows you to reroute, reschedule that package, let us know where you want us to leave it. If you want, uh, we, predict, we algorithmically predict a uh, you know, four-hour delivery window that we're going to be at your, your home through, uh, through data analytics uh, to, to ensure that uh, you know, we, we establish the connectivity with you. Um, and what's amazing about it is the response? You know, we've, it's been out for you know uh, you know a little over two or three years, and uh, we already have uh, you know over 17 million folks signed up, and there's 150,000 week in and week out that are that are signing up for the service, and I think it kind of speaks to you know what the the demand is out there um, to be able to to find what I want when I want it and get it get it uh, get it exactly where I want it. And uh, so, so, it's, so, so, it's, so it's very exciting. Uh, at this point, I'd like you to open up to the audience for questions. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And if you can state uh, your name and your company, we'd appreciate that. Uh, I see one in the back there. Hi, I'm from Accenture. I have a question for the minister. And um, how the digital technology will impact the current international trade framework, say WTO, or uh, on the other way around, how um, the current uh, international trade framework, like WTO, will be a current obstacle to the de development of uh, uh, digital technology um, in the international trade area. Well, uh, thank you. Um, WTO has been around for quite some time. We began with gas, and WTO has evolved uh, into uh, something quite, uh, you know, I mean, it's changing with the times. So e-commerce and the digital economy has got to be part of uh, a trade policy in WTO. Let me zero in on one example, or two. One is uh, we have what we call the regional comprehensive economic partnership negotiations involving 10 countries in ASEAN, Malaysia and other countries in ASEAN, and six other countries, including China. And uh, we are in the process of negotiating this, uh, this trade agreement among 16 countries, and e-commerce is uh, very much uh, part of the discussion. So uh, in many uh, trade negotiations, and certainly trade policy, uh, we are responding, uh, you might say we are uh, we're not moving fast enough, of course, developments in technology are moving rapidly. Uh, but I can assure you that, you know, we are, we're catching up uh, very, very fast. Uh, and in the RCEP negotiations, uh, we, have a, we are discussing a chapter, and Malaysia happens to be chairman of this working group on e-commerce. So this is one example. And uh, at the ASEAN level, uh, I mean, we have, uh, as I said, as I told you, an ICT master plan. Uh, we also have a single window with a customs initiative. Yeah? So these are changes in technology which are, which are happening. Uh, and uh, I think we are responding quite fast. And this is so important uh, to facilitate uh, uh, growth in trade um, in China and throughout the world. Yeah? We are all adopting. I mean, both the hardware and the software uh, are moving in, uh, in tandem. Uh, and I, I'm confident. Uh, that uh, the various uh, initiatives being put in place both at the national and regional levels, uh, ASEAN and other regions, uh, will be able to uh, take full account of uh, developments in technology and, and software. So many of these, these things are already incorporated in a number of trade agreements and trade negotiations. And RCEP 
uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, is one such example. There's, there's a discussion on e-commerce. Yeah? I mean, providing the broad policy framework uh, in order to ensure that uh, you know, uh, we are not left out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's another question down here in front. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm coming from the new media platform, Shen Sixing. Actually, unfortunately, I'm an ex-consultant. So my question is to Mr. Paul. Actually, the CTO is quite a weird position in a consulting firm. So my question is, how do the consulting firms or consulting companies transfer their business to better fit or support to the digitalized world? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and something where we think about a lot. Uh, and. Uh, CTO is, a, is an unusual position at a, at a company like ours, but we created the position because of the importance that technology plays in the you know, digital transformation, everything that we're seeing across, uh, across every industry. And the way that we're transforming our company, I can't talk to the industry overall, but the way that we're transforming our company is to uh, look at you know, providing services in a different way in the digital world. What we believe in, a digital, in the digital economy is that uh, companies want to buy outcomes. They want to buy, uh, they don't necessarily want to buy a team of consultants to solve a problem for them. What they want is increased efficiency or higher sales or more efficient manufacturing processes. So what we're, what we're doing with our company is restructuring the way we go to market and the way restructuring our business around being able to solve problems like that in a way where you know, companies can buy them very differently in a consumption-based basis where they're buying outcomes to problems rather than buying you know, inputs of, of consultants to solve problems. We believe that that's the, you know, that's what the digital world means for a firm like ours, and that's the way we're structuring our services accordingly. Interesting. Just before we go on to a question, uh, I think, uh, Hank, there's a point you wanted to make about uh, sort of the future of e-commerce. Well, our that moderator asked a really good question about is the future here, yes. right? Yes. And I had just a thought about that because in my mind, the future is just beginning in many ways, yes. right? So, so you think about the world today, all right? Everything is identified by what the labor package says, including all of us, all right? Because you have to take out your passports and your driver's license and, and your work economic form badge, which I'm not wearing right now, in order to know who you are. Yeah. But imagine a future, right? Imagine a future where you go walk up to a product or a person and you tap on your Google Glass or you tap on your iPhone, mm. okay? And embed it into the very fabric of a product, whether it's a Heineken beer, mm. or Chinese tobacco, or milk powder, or pharmaceutical, or one of your packages. Devoid of that labor package, I can know exactly what that thing is, or who you are, mm. or if your suit is uh, Louis Vuitton or uh, Ross Dress for Less. There's going to be a part of the future where information you would be far more ubiquitous than even we can possibly imagine today. Mm. And to your point earlier, Paul, it's just a really good one, right? Technology would be used to decrease illegitimate use, but also dramatically advance legitimate use, right? The average senior citizen in the United States takes 14 pills a day, every day. Yeah. It's extremely confusing. They can't get it straight. If they spill the bottle out of the packet on the table, they can't, they can't recover the 14 pills. Some of them take 15, 20 pills. Imagine, you take out your iPhone, you, get a, you do a single scan, you know which pill is what, when you're supposed to take it, and upon consuming that, that pill, yeah. It's logged and registered and memorialized for you, your parents, your family, and your physician. Think about that digital future. That future is just beginning. Mm. So, so I think you asked a really critical question. Yeah. Is the future here? Yeah, the future is starting. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah no, the, the changes are, are uh, truly fascinating. And it does raise this question of whether you know, companies are actually ready to handle all of the data that's going to be coming back to them. You think about you know, every single person and all the data coming back. Um, I know they're already starting to grapple with that. Um, more questions out there? Uh, lots of them. Um, why don't we take one from the, the side over here? The lady in the front. Uh, microphone will come your way. Just one moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, down here in front, please. Hi. Allie Clark from Trade Shift. Uh, thanks for talking about the Internet of Things. Um, I have a question for the group. Uh, can you please share how digitizing supply chains and global trade makes way for the circular economy and such things as chemical awareness in design or a reverse supply chain? 
second part, uh, can you, additionally, how can companies begin the process of digitizing trade when it so drastically disrupts the model of a linear supply chain? Hmm. Okay, who'd like to take a, a, take a stab at the circular supply chain? I'll, I'll take a, a cut at the, the second part of the, the sure. question, so I'll enter the Great. second, we can work, work backward. I think the uh, question is how do you move from a linear supply chain to you know, what we would call it a digital supply network, whatever you call the, the, the new form of a supply chain. And uh, one thing we haven't talked a lot about on the panel, but I think is, is really important, is mm -hmm. the role of, uh, of, of new platforms in, that, are, that are needed to provide services in a different way. I'll you know, just give you an example. You can, uh, many of you will be familiar with what GE is doing with their Predix platform or what Philips is doing with their Health Suite platform for healthcare. And there's many other examples like that. And the reason that those platforms are springing up is because in a, in a connected world with Internet of Things and this digital, you know, digital supply chains, the, we're not just delivering products or services, we're delivering information continuously. And, you know, I have a, a you know, two-way connection of information pro being provided continuously. And we need, you know, we need common business platforms and technology platforms to enable the right flow of, uh, of information and services. So one thing that we're seeing in many industries is a race to establish those standardized platforms. So you see it in industrial equipment with what GE is doing versus Siemens and Schneider and, and other companies that are in that, that industry. And we're seeing multiple you know, you know, platforms like that in the healthcare industry. And uh, only a couple will succeed. And I think the, there's a, you know, I think there's a, uh, what we're seeing among the companies in those industries is companies are deciding do they want to be the platform setter or do they want to be the, partic the platform participant in those industries and that's, um, and that's a strategic decision that many companies need to make. So it's, a, it's, a, so it's a decision on how you structure your supply chain but there's also a decision on what, to what extent do you want to play that role in your industry of you know, standardizing the information right. flow and the way products and services are delivered via these you know, digital platforms that are emerging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I would just add I think, I think that part of this notion of the circular economy is about you know, how we run our supply chains more sustainably. And you know, we've got a new uh, dispatch program out there that's, that's digitally enabled called uh, Orion for our, uh, our delivery, delivery drivers. And just to take a step back, when, when, when you think about the number of ways that you could go about you know, the errands that you have on the weekend. If you, if you were to have to run six errands on the weekend, there's actually 720 ways that you could run the order of those errands. And if you go up to 12 errands, it's 500 million ways. Now, now at UPS, we've prided ourselves for years at, well, you know, we used to have a slogan called the tightest ship in the shipping business. And, and I think back then we were the tightest ship in the shipping business, but we found out that through, through, through mm. digital and technology, we could be that much more efficient. And this program now takes a driver's route, and a typical driver could have 100 pickup and delivery stops a day. Mm. And we found out that through technology, that this Orion machine could cut six to eight miles off a driver's route delivering all the same pickup and delivery stops. Um, and uh, and our, our engineers, when they first saw this, they didn't believe it. There's no way that anybody could do it better than us. Certainly our drivers didn't believe after coming back the next day that they actually cut six to eight miles off their route doing the same exact work they did the day before and meeting all the service level requirements of our customers. Well, that's, that, that's, that, that's, that's it's extremely powerful because, because what that does is it saves UPS 100 million miles a year of driving, it saves 10 million gallons of fuel, and it saves 100,000 metric tons of CO2, and to boot it saves cost of about 300, 400, 300 to 400 million dollars a year, you know, which obviously can be passed on to consumers, shippers, and, and certainly uh, you know, make UPS you know, you know, uh, uh, returns to our share owners e even better. And I, and I, and I think that's that's the power of digitization. When you apply that to how you optimize the entire supply chain from you know, source to shelf and then back through recycling, uh, it's, 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 it's endless. So you're right, the, we're at the beginning of the future. It's fascinating. Has anybody estimated the potential savings from those kinds of efficiencies to supply chains? Yeah, so uh, oh, overall, I mean, the, the Orion project for us in the United yeah. States is about 300 to 400 million dollars. Huh. Um, so you can imagine you know, uh, applying that type of data analytics to 
uh, to, to su supply chains uh, and, you know, uh, and, and supply and demand. Uh, it's tremendous. I talked earlier about, you know, the, the amount of inventory that's out there. Um, and, and much of that inventory is, you know, these days with high tech op obsolesces, even in healthcare, right? It obsolesces if it's, uh, if it's not used in a, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner. So right. there's uh, just tremendous amount of uh, uh, savings and opportunity there. Right, right. More questions? Um, gentleman over there. Hi, it's, my name is Larry Stone from uh, BT. Um, at the one end, you've got um, in digital trade, you've got uh, a debate around free and, trans and open transborder data flows, for example, the trade in services agreement with about 50 odd countries. On the other hand, you've got a lot of countries developing data localization laws and strong data privacy laws. And how do, how's the panel see those things balancing over time? Mm -hmm. Who would like to take a crack at uh, sort of adapting to the, the laws that companies, uh, countries are, are developing around this? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I, I think that, that uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all concerned about, uh, you know, privacy of data. Um, um, and so I think it's, it, it's got to be managed very carefully and securely and, uh, and, and where it's needed to, to ensure um, you know, secure, you know, high integrity, safe supply chains, uh, we need to enable that information to cross borders because it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. On the other hand, you know, we've got to make sure that we're managing that information, you know, in a way that, that, that absolutely makes sense so that it's not being used for any other purpose than, uh, you know, the, the desired purpose for, um, you, know, uh, you know, transfer of goods or or services uh, across borders, so it's a you know it's a it's a, it's a very technical issue, but we've we, we we've got to spend the right amount of time on it um, and diligence to make sure we craft something that's that's holistic and makes sense, and don't uh, you know move one way or the other down the uh, down the extremes, or we're gonna um, we're we're gonna stifle the future, right, right, and the bright future. Yeah, and uh, Hank, I guess privacy issues for you guys, it's. Uh, something very serious to consider. Uh, there are few things as private as the medications that you take and how often you take them, and uh, potentially the, the chips that you have could be used to track that. Uh, any thoughts about how you tackle that? Sure. There's, that really, there's really two components to that, right? On the one hand, the product information is completely available and open to the public because right. everybody has the right to interrogate to understand what is it that's in front of them, you know, whether it's a Coke or Nike. Um, um, T-shirt or Gucci bag or your pharmaceutical, all right? That information needs to be made available and uh, easily interrogated by the public. Um, when the public interrogates that information, there's a tremendous amount of data there. Of course, we will ask for their um, permission if that data can be uh, combined with other people's data into a much larger data set, basically. Um, but, you know, to that circular economy question, which I've been thinking about since you asked it, it's, we had a session in Davos earlier this year uh, where the CEO of Walmart was in the same panel to talk about uh, the circular economy. But it goes not just from cradle to grave, but it goes from cradle to cradle, all right? Because product can recycle through the food chain many times over. But in order to do that, you must have certainty what that product is, where it came from, where it's going. You have to be able to document and track its entire provenance through and through, basically. So you have to be able to securely identify that product forever, for its entire life of its existence. We have time for one more question. Okay. Um, the woman there on the aisle, please. Just one moment. A microphone will come your way. Uh, just, just a moment. There's a microphone coming to you. Thank you, I almost gave up. <laughs> Aniko from Singapore Management University. If the future is here, then what kind of talent or human capital would you need to develop to you know, meet the needs of the digital trade economy of the future? Very good question. So what are the human capital implications of all of this, this technology? Um, Firstly, uh, uh, Sata, yeah, please. let me venture. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Firstly, going back to the earlier question, I think there's a need for regular communication and dialogue between governments and various uh, organizations, international organizations, with companies. And that dialogue has been going on. It's important to strengthen the process uh, so that 
we are in a position to have a, a set of rules and regulations on security. So I, I think that's important, mm -hmm. regular communication and dialogue between the various stakeholders uh, and governments and also international organizations. On human capital, this is uh, indeed uh, a challenge, especially for developing countries. Mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, I think for us, uh, where we come from, the digital divide certainly uh, is, is, a, is a big issue. I mean, that is a problem in, in itself, uh, trying to get more people on board and trying to get more people to embrace <coughs> digitization and the, the Internet of Things. Mm. Uh, we do not want this phenomenon to create an even bigger disparity in incomes, and, and that, that's a danger of that happening uh, if uh, there's, there are no policies uh, put in place. So human capital uh, development, I mean, I'm talking at a general level, of course, yeah, uh, is certainly uh, important in the context of narrowing the digital divide. Uh, the other is to increase incomes. In the end, whatever we do as a politician, it's got to benefit uh, the masses, the people uh, throughout the world uh, develop in developing countries. Uh, so for that uh, to happen, uh, of course, human capital development uh, is so essential. Uh, otherwise, uh, some parts of the world are going to benefit uh, from this, others are not. And finally, this issue of the big and the small. I mean, uh, we know that uh, the digital initiatives are coming not only from Silicon Valley, it's coming from all over the world. Uh, I was reading one piece of information they, they call price sniffing. I think it's a Singapore example. Uh, our professor from Singapore, uh, this wash company, yeah? which uh, developed the software, and it actually detects the, the, uh, for, for the same kind of uh, model, uh, the uh, same kind of uh, uh, brand uh, of watches, this company has developed a software to find out what other competitors, I mean, what, what, what's the kind of price they're selling the consumer. And by having this application, this company has been able to, to offer very competitive rates to customers. So, uh, you know, we need to nurture uh, and develop human capital and uh, capacity building also at a small level. I mean, multinationals, yes, but small, medium enterprises <coughs> benefited. The taxi, Uber, and Grab Taxi, and others uh, are good examples. They started small, and now they become, uh, in China and other places, they become so pervasive. So you need uh, to get the smaller guys uh, involved uh, in this as well. Thank you. Great. Good. We're just about out of time. So I'd like the panelists just to, to wrap up. Um, Tell us sort of the one, one key takeaway that you'd like to leave the audience with. Um, Paul, can I start with you? Yeah, I guess the, the key takeaway that I'd leave is, is uh, I think it's the time to think, for companies to think, you know, about the radical disruption of what they do. And one of the things, uh, we've, we did a, a survey with the forum uh, earlier in the year, and one of the things that turned, out, turned up was that 87% of executives believe that this is disruptive for their companies and going to really tra transform their companies. But only, that's 87%, only 7% felt they had a plan and knew what they needed to do. So there's a tremendous chasm there in, in understanding. It gets a little bit to human capital and skills that, that you need to go through the transformation. I think what's required is to really think differently and think radically about where your business is going to make sure you're one of the ones that thrive in the new world right. rather than one of the ones that's challenged in the new world. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Minister? Firstly, uh, I think uh, whatever we do, uh, we need to make sure that we have good outcomes. And one would be increasing the incomes and opportunities, uh, business op opportunities for big and small. Uh, number two, I think it's important to be aware that we need to reduce the gap you know, between small and medium enterprises, rural and urban. This is very important. We do not want the, the gap to widen as a result of di digital technology. Finally, uh, I think it's important for governments uh, to respond quickly. Uh, um, uh, national governments and international organizations uh, to provide uh, a broad uh, policy framework which is conducive for the development of a digital economy. On, on, this, on this subject, uh, I think it is gratifying to note uh, that many countries have done that. Yeah? Uh, we all realize the importance of, of the digital economy and in ASEAN we've got this ICT master plan and every country has got that, so the challenge is on implementation. So it's important to provide a, a good policy framework to enable the orderly and proper development of the digital economy to benefit uh, the, the masses and to make sure that it does not lead to a widening of the income gap between the rich and the poor. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, um, I, I would say my, 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 my final thought would be that due to the digital economy and technology advanced supply chains, you know, for small, medium enterprises, the 
you know, international, you know, borders have never been more permeable. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I, I think that due to the, the same phenomenon of the digital economy, that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to stop the Ill illegitimate trade that, that, that occurs out there has, has never been, you know, uh, you know more, in our, more, in our, more in our grasp. Mm -hmm. So just a uh, tremendous opportunity out there for small and medium enterprises. Uh, no matter where you are, most of your consumers are sitting outside of your country borders. And Hank. Uh, okay, a few things. Next time when you uh, eat a pill or take your food, <laughs> think about where it came from and how do you make sure it's not a piece of uh, brick dust or recycled paint. Number two, I forgot to actually show you these chips because I was asked to. So in this little vial, we have four million chips size a piece of dust, each with millions of combinations of spectral data. I'll share a funny story with you, right? So security here is really tight. I was walking through the, the, the doors at the Shangri-La last night, and I forgot I had this little bottle of white powder in my pocket. <laughs> so I got frisked, right, by the lady. So she, got, she came to this, she said, what is it? So it took me a while to explain it. Um, <clears throat> but um, think about a future where labels are obsolete, right? where digital information is embedded in the very fabric of everything you touch in life. Think about that future, because that future is going to be here much sooner than any of us anticipate. Great. And with that, we'll end the panel session. Thank you very much to the panelists.